Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks uh, so much for sticking around all through the break. Hope you had something good to drink. And uh, we're going to spend more time in the second half here hearing your stories, uh, taking questions from you. We have a microphone set up in the center where so that everybody can hear you and see you. All right. So while you're coming up with these questions and lining up by the microphone, don't all rush at once. Um, I actually do want to give one or two of Terry's um, notes because this, this one actually is one of my pet peeves, uh, maybe for slightly different reason than, than yours, but it's the producer, director, finger snapper, right? <laughs> it's, it's the one who knows exactly what frame to cut on and will stand behind you and go, and cut here, right? and cut here. So for me, this is actually, I don't know, this is not a disaster. It's, it's more of a uh, pet peeve uh, because I frankly don't know how to edit that way. I don't know why they're choosing one frame as opposed to another. Uh, and the only thing I know is that I'm a pair of hands there. So that makes me insane. I find it much better if a director producer says what they're missing, why they want something there. And so um, while we're waiting for the crush of people in the center <laughs> mic, personality differences in the editing room. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? Uh, how they work, how you get past them, what you learn from them, and if they've ever driven you fleeing from the editing room. <laughs> I, I know you want to talk, so you go. I saw you just so, getting ready. I guess at the end of the day, the producer or director or execs, whatever type of thing you're working on, has the final say. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as an editor, you know, I actually call myself an adult babysitter yeah. most of the time. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, you have your opinion. You cut, usually, I do a rough cut myself. Um, and what I kind of think it should be, and then they have their ideas. So even if you disagree with them, at the end of the day, you're negotiating. You know, at the end of the day, their their side can win. You know, like they're, they're the execs. You kind of have to give them the product they ask for. Um, and I've never so disagreed with them that I'm like, this is the worst. I will not put my name on this. You know, it's never that bad. Um, so I just think with their, you know yelling at you or just yelling at somebody else in the room, you know, I just kind of quiet down and let them argue until they come to whatever conclusion they come to. And then I show them. And usually I'm editing whatever they're arguing about already. And so by the time the argument's over, I'm like, let's watch it yeah. and see if yeah. that's something you want, mm -hmm. you know? So the, and let's use finger snapping as a stand in <laughs> for um, behavior or manipulative behavior or um, uh, treating the editor like I, a pair of hands. I anyway. have not had the snap, because I don't think we work in like real time by any means. Um, touching the keyboard is more my pet peeve if they come over and, but it's really a frame. They're like, I want, just move it two frames. I'm like, what? Um, and what I've learned, if I don't even want to move it, because it's going to screw up a transition, and I don't want to deal with shifting things around. If, I just realized if you start clicking, they legit think you are doing something. <laughs> so I just click, I click, I click, I click, and yeah. make things look like they're moving on the screen, which really I just go into trim mode because it changes the screen, and I come back out, and I play it again. They're like, ah, that's better. I'm like, okay. I've had the exact same thing yeah. happen where they'll be like, okay, we want to, you know, can, can you, like, cut, like, two, three frames later? And I, I, or, like, I'll be fixing the audio, and I haven't touched the video. Yes. Yeah. And you'll be previewing the audience because you have to listen to it to be able to know if it works. And they'll be back there and they'll be go, oh my God, that's perfect. Whatever you did, that's perfect. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know? sure, I totally did something here. <laughs> so that's the plus side of the client monitor. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> Downside. So Sydney, what about you? How do you deal with I, the... I feel like I'm there to work with the director or the producers any way, any way they want. So I've had directors that wanted to come in and cut scenes with me and as far as I'm concerned that's fine if they want to tell me where to cut and if I'm doing that with a director and I have another idea I'll say why don't we try this or that and then you know when we're finished with the scene the director probably will go away and I'll 
work on the scene more and add stuff or recut or do it, you know, and show it to them and say, take a look at this, I worked on it a little, and they'll say, that's great. So on the other hand, most of the time you're cutting on your own and showing them a, a cut, either of a scene or a, usually the whole show. And then uh, other times they just want to give you notes and they come back and look at the cut and give you more notes. Mm -hmm. So I, there's so many ways, different ways that people like to work that you just have to be willing to adapt to their way of working. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I, I don't, I don't feel necessarily that I'm, you know, not being respected because I feel like I'm going to, however they want to work, I'll contribute within that that method of working. Because mm -hmm. um, however we, however I, you're working. You're still getting ideas, and you share them with them, and you're still, you know, seeing possibilities that you're you're trying. So, and that's that's what you're there to do. And so, <clears throat> Lindsay Klingman, who was one of my early mentors, um, told me that you leave your ego at the door as an editor. You have to do that. And she was speaking specifically about scripted, um, true for showrunners, producers, and all of that, and what you do. Yeah, you know, with, with editors, it's kind of interesting because editors, just by the nature of the job, have egos because you are, you know, the, the final person touching the show. And so you have an ego about it. But then you also have to let go of your ego when you get the notes back because everybody has a different vision of what it should be. But then, you know, the kind of the pet peeve, getting, working in the pet peeve is when you get a note back that says, fix this. It's like what audio, video? Is it the cut? Do you want to dissolve? You know, is is so, so it's like those kinds of notes are not constructive. It's like tell me what to fix, or at least give me some direction. I'll look at it. I'll go. I don't see anything wrong. So I'll like you know trim it one frame and go. Okay, it's fixed. Mm -hmm. You know, but <laughs> well, what, what do you do? Do you ever go back and say what is the problem for yeah, you? Yeah, the show, show that I work on currently. Um, with the way that we work, it's like if I see like, okay, I don't quite understand the note, we have enough trust with our producers that it, we can go back to them we can, we, or we can push back and say, I don't agree with this note, I think that it looks better this way because I'm the one looking at the footage and they're not in the edit bay with me looking at the footage. So like if they say fix this and I don't know what they're talking about because I don't see anything wrong at that point, like I, you know, to be diplomatic you go, hey, is this the right time code? Because I'm not seeing what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And then usually they'll come back and go, oh, well, it was the wrong time code. Or, oh, I, I just don't like that, you know, the contestant has a funny look on their face or something, you know. Then it's something that's completely not related to the edit, but that it's something that they want mm -hmm. different. And, you know, it goes back to everybody kind of having different sensibilities of what they want. Mm -hmm. and as long as we have, like, another angle or some place where I can slide the shot, it's like, okay, great, I can fix it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, too, though, if you're on a show with multiple execs and you get notes from five different people that have five completely different opinions, um, and they watch different cuts. Like, you, there's a rough cut, and they someone an exec gave notes on a rough cut, so you did those notes. So now the cut has changed, but then so, second exec gives notes on that same old rough cut. But you're like, wait, that doesn't even exist anymore. Should I add that note back, or mm -hmm. you know, keep the cut the way it is, let them see the new cut, and be like, hey, there's a new cut. Watch that. Did you, you know, kind of like this? So it's really clever. To Multiple voices can get really maddening. That mm -hmm. really can. I mean, you were mentioning that. I was on a show recently where I'd get, at the beginning, we were getting notes from the, the line producer, from the co-producer, co-executive producer, and yeah. from the, uh, the showrunner, and some one other person. And finally, I went to the showrunner. I said, you know, first of all, we have to, you know, it would be great if we collated these. And then if we knew which ones, saying this to the showrunner, which, which ones you think are worth, worth doing and uh, which ones are absolutely not worth doing and, you know, which ones you think we should explore. And she came up with a great idea, which is she, we got, so finally we, her assistant collated everything and color-coded them as according to who it was, and then she would put her comments with each note. So at least we had all the notes together. We could go, I could go through all those notes and 
and know where I was at. Mm -hmm. and, and who is saying what and what the showrunner thought we should really concentrate on. So that coordination, I think, is crucial on any yeah. show that I've done. Well, yeah, other times, you know, you're, you're, you finish everybody's notes and you're ready to go and suddenly <coughs> the a final a set of notes come from the other executive producer who waited to the very last minute. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like... And then maybe you can't even find the showrunner. It's like, do I do these? Do I not do these? It's like, I don't care. I'll do whatever notes I get. But I know that ultimately the showrunner has the final say. And it just, it's sort of maddening. So one thing that I'm hearing from all of you is the editor who uh, fiercely guards that first cut or the second cut or something is the ex-editor, right? Career. Career killer, yes. Yeah. I think that people probably tend to do that early in their career because there's that ego and like you know you you've got this job and you're trying to like prove that you are the best editor out there, but you so so you have more of the ego and then you learn as as you get more experienced that it's not an us versus them thing. It's 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 a collaboration, mm -hmm. and I know you know I've had job interviews where they're like, well, how do you deal with notes? And it's like, well, you know, if, if I disagree you with a note, them. you do <laughs> them, yeah, yeah, because ultimately, yeah, I might not agree with every note, but if the producer the producer is the boss, and you know, if it's a note that I feel strongly about, I will like write out this is why we can't do this or this is why we shouldn't do that. And you know, most jobs that I've had, the producer will listen and go, "Okay, you made a good point. We'll leave it this way." Or what I'll do is, you know, like I've done the same thing where, you know, whatever they're talking about in the background, I'm sitting there working on and like putting together. Like the producer's trying to figure out what do I want, and I'm editing what he wants, and I show it to them, and you know, nine times out of ten, they're like, "That's exactly it." Or if there's two different options to do, I will prepare both of them. And then if the producer in the edit bay goes, this isn't quite working, what are our other options? I'll go, okay, well, we have these three other options that I've already edited together because I knew that this was going to be a problem spot. And that kind of comes from experience. Like, I can tell you when I sit down to edit an episode of my show and watch the show, I'm like, well, I'm going to get a note from the network on that, and I'm going to get a note from the producer on that. And it's just, just by nature of what's happening on the show. But I know that if I cut those things out, in the first cut, they're going to go, well, what did you cut out here? Mm -hmm. So you leave them in knowing that you're going to get the note <laughs> because you want them to see the bad thing first so that then they're like, oh, okay, this is a great solution to mm -hmm. fix it. But if I know if I fix it now, they're going to ask, You'll what did I do here? Right. Yeah. 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 The same is true on scripted where your first cut's generally the script yeah. in the order with all the lines, even the ones you don't know, uh, the, even the ones that you know will not end up in there. Um, because otherwise someone's going to ask you to put it yeah. back in so they can come to the You are not to take anything personal. Like, mm -hmm. notes are not personal. They're not a hit against you as an editor in any way. It's just, especially when you're just shooting something, you don't really know how the end product's going to look when you're on set. So they're just seeing it, too, for the first time. So it's just, it's just such a collaborative thing of really trying to put this story together. Mm -hmm. so nothing's personal at all. It's just you working with producers, directors, execs, whatever, networks, um, just trying to get the story done, you know, it's, you know, I'm not the final say, execs, no one's really the final say, it's just, let's all figure this out. It better be a final say somewhere. And, and, yeah. I, will, I will say, where the notes aren't necessarily personal, they can feel personal. And that can hurt, like, if you have an executive that doesn't have good people skills, and, you know, there's been times where I've gotten a note from a pr producer that I, like, loved and loved my work that said, this is awful. This is a train wreck. And you can't take that personally because it's pro it's not necessarily because of how you edited it. It has a lot of things. It might be because it was shot poorly and you did the best you could. Um, but you, even if the producer writes the note in a way that seems personal, you can't take it that way. Because I mean, we, have, we have producers I've worked with that they... they are new producers, so they're not quite sure. They, they don't know how, I mean, the, the written work, because they're not sitting in the edit bay with me going, hey, something's not right here, let's fix it. They're, you know, sitting at their computer writing a note, not thinking about, there's a person on the other side of this note. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, 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 it's a computer screen that they're looking at. And they, they don't think about the fact that now there's an editor who's had a bad day, and, you know, 
your cat died and you know your car got ran into on your way to work and you know you're just having the worst day ever and you get this note that says this is terrible and you just want to cry mm -hmm. and so you can't you have to try not to take that personal it's, it's not always easy but you can't let that get to you because then tomorrow you might get a show get a show with no note that they say this is the best thing i've ever seen and so you've got to kind of step away from it a little so then bit. it's okay if your cat died <laughs> it was hard to get past the cat dog part. I have to say. This also feeds into uh, the discussion that we were having a little bit about deadlines. Uh, so, uh, one of uh, one of the questions that we got was about um, uh, you know what happens when someone comes in and wants to change everything right before the deadline. Um, the way that I would also the way that I've come across this are directors who just want to keep cutting until one minute before air or one minute before screening or something. And there's, realistically, you can't do that and provide them with a watchable cut. So what are some of the devices that you've used to keep people on track deadline-wise? I usually claim OT. <laughs> and that gets them to. It's budget. Budget's really the only thing they seem to listen to. Even if to. it's three in the afternoon, yeah. you go, oh, I'm about to break it. Okay. Yeah, so they say, like, well, I'm double time now, so if you really want to do this. Okay. I suspect the answer might be different from Sydney, so. Yeah. I usually go to my assistant who's going to have to output it or finish it technically to either prepare for a screening or put it on, you know, upload it to PIX or something. And I say, how much time do you need? And then, okay, let's add an extra hour, hour and a half, two hours for some technical glitch. And I go to the director and I say, we have to be finished by 2.30 because my assistant needs this amount of time to get it prepared. And usually that works. I mean, there's, it has to work because otherwise the, the show won't get out. Yeah. Uh, I guess I, the one change I would make to that is Maybe this is just the people who I've worked with, but if you need really two hours to prepare, I say three. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I add add time. You add time. I mean, I do remember years ago I was working on Young Doctors in Love, and we were on Pico Boulevard, um, and they were screening, and at, at the time it was Goldwyn. I think it's now called The Lot. The Lot. And it was Gary Marshall film, and we were making changes so late that they were actually started the screening while they, the assistants were still syncing up the, wow. the tracks and trying to get them over to the, the screening room across town. It was, it was really nutty. That doesn't work so well nowadays with the It doesn't work so well line. nowadays. I, you, you, yeah, you'd have to have one file there. It was sort of, yeah. you know, broken up <laughs> into reels. I think the biggest thing, kind of what they were saying, it sounds like it boils down to communication. Like on, you know, on some shows I've worked on, they're like, oh, well, you know, the show doesn't air till Monday. I just don't have to give you notes till Sunday night. It's like, no, you have to give us notes on Friday. And again, you kind of inflate the deadlines, you know, because you know that if you tell them that you need notes by 6 o'clock on Friday, you'll get them by 10 a.m. Sunday. Yeah, so it's if, if, if you have that pat in you, and it is kind of knowing your producers and your directors. And if you know that they're going to push the deadlines like that, then you tell them the deadlines earlier <laughs> so that they don't, you know, run into that. That's a great point. Um, so another question um, that we got from the Twitter <laughs> is, uh, what are the everyday technical challenge as an editor that you experience, and how have you overcome them? Um, I, technical, I would say probably like I'm on an effect heavy show. So if they just ask for something that you're just totally not sure tech wise how to do it kind of a thing. Um, I mean, it's just trial and error. You just either you say you can't do it. Um, and I don't know if that means technical challenges. If that means like software issues or if that's just editing technical take, issues. Take it whichever way you'd like to go. Um, yeah, I, you know, I take it as a learning experience. If I don't know how to do something and they're asking for it tech wise. Um, I make it a trial and error, I guess, um, and try it 10 times. And if I still can't figure it out, then I go ask somebody what in the world they need. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I always try to do it myself. So first. the scheduling is also a technical issue, right? Because you have X to do, and hopefully you can fit it into Y amount of time. 
on so those are some technical issues mm -hmm. it's it's not always about the equipment but you talked about how you were having trouble exporting right? mm -hmm. and so that's a technical issue as well all of which you just have to deal with right there's no way around yeah, it. Yeah, no, if i run into a technical challenge that's my responsibility to figure out like oh they want to do some crazy effect that like they want to paint something out or they want to you know track something i'll google it and you know if it's something that isn't under my umbrella that's like, oh, my computer was crashing or it was freezing. You know, we, you, know, you find the people who are supposed to know those things mm -hmm. and you say, hey, this is going on. And, um, you know, we're lucky in our situation where we have techs on site. So if our computer crashes, hopefully they can fix it quickly. <laughs> I think right. the one good thing about posts to an extent is when technical issues happen, there's, there's no faking it. Like, the, you know, they always say you can fake stuff in post. Editing-wise, yes, but tech-wise, no. If an export takes two hours, there's no way to speed that up. It takes two hours. So if execs think you're lying about the deadline or something, you're, like, those things you can't. If it takes up 200 gigs and you only have 100 gigs left on the drive, like, there's nothing you can do. You have to fix that situation. And there's no moving on until that's fixed. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, that's actually sometimes a good thing. It's just we have to stop down and fix this before mm -hmm. anyone can move on. Like, so some of this, it strikes me, has to do, you said communication, I think that's absolutely right, has to do with building trust um, between uh, you and the people who are your superiors. Uh, so when you say it's going to take two hours, they believe you. So some of this has to do with building trust. Now, one of the ways that I think those of us who are in schools, uh, in school programs, uh, do it is they work with people. And then eventually you build a circle of people who have trust in you. How do you do it if you haven't been to a school program? How do you do when you come out here uh, to a new city? How do you build that circle? It just takes time. I mean, it, it, it takes time. It takes, you know, like if you are new and trying to build it, to grab every opportunity that you can and, and get to know people. and get you know even if it's you know like we talked about earlier if it's a job logging it gets you in the door and then maybe stay late and shadow an assistant editor and you know get to know them and learn how they do things and then eventually you know you'll be able to oh well we need somebody who can do this and our assistant editor is out sick and you can go oh i know how to do that you know and then they they you know that will build you know they'll go oh well we know that we can go to you when something happens and and so you are our go-to person, then you right. become, you know, it's just, it takes time. It, it's, you know, that's really, we all hate patients, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it takes time. Well, we also, I think Terry mentioned that we all hate kind of getting up in front of people. <laughs> yeah. I actually haven't found that to be true with a lot of people I know, but one of the ways of doing is we're more responsible now, I think, than ever to putting ourselves out in front of people than we ever have events like this, uh, or uh, Creative Cow, or just being out there helping people, I think. Is I think the older you get to, you, like I was a, like more of an, an introvert, I'd say most editors are introverts, you know, I wasn't the most outgoing person in the world. But when, I, I do think networking is a huge, huge part of it. Yes, you need to know the software, but networking is so big, and when you are not an outgoing person, that is a very difficult thing to get out of your comfort zone on. I think networking is just a huge part of it to Got get to people to trust you. And I just, the older you get, the more, you, you know, when you can't pay rent, you know, you get out there and you get loud. And, and the more you do that, you mean it, with it the, gets so much with easier. With the little cup at the edge of the freeway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll edit for food. Edit for food, yeah, right. Yeah, that's our second job. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think you do have to put yourself out there, which is hard to do when you're just starting. You don't want to talk to, the, like, who do you talk to? You don't want to talk to the wrong person, you know, kind of a thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's there, there was a fine balance because we kind of touched on earlier, you know, having jobs take advantage of you by having low pay and long hours, but needing that experience. And there's a really fine line between the people that, you know, because because like for every job, you know, we all get on the avid editors of Facebook group and people make fun of the jobs that are like, oh, we need you to do like 900 amazing things and we're going to pay you $200 a week. And people flame those people, but there are people out there that will take those jobs, and which which is a double-edged sword because there's people out there that need those jobs. But the more people that take those jobs, the harder it is for us to get 
the rates that we deserve. Mm -hmm. And so there is just, you know, like networking and getting people to trust you, then you're going to be able to find those jobs that aren't do everything for $200 a week. But the more people you know, the less you'll have to take those jobs. Mm -hmm. And the more you'll find jobs that value you and will pay you for the skills that you have. Right, and that's putting yourself out there. Um, so I'm going to go to one more question. We have another question we have here. But I'm also going to reframe it for us as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, so the question is, um, with all the problems Abbott has, will it reign supreme with young editors in the near future? So let me kind of rephrase that for a second, because I think you've a little bit dealt with that already in terms of what's out there in our market here in LA and New York. Um, but I tell my students that they need to know all the three A's, right? Avid, Apple, Adobe, and Black Magic. Um, <laughs> uh, and what I mean by that is you gotta know as much as you can know. So having said that then, what do you think, if I were to give you a crystal ball, Here's a crystal ball. Uh, in three years, what do you think you'd be looking for in an assistant or a post PA or someone starting? What kind of skill set? I, and is Avid one of them? I mean, yes, Avid's not in three years. Avid will still be uh, a relevant skill set. Um, I, I agree with you. Need unfortunately, you need to know all. <laughs> um, but usually, what I tell young people learning any software, I do think if you learn Avid first, the rest are so much easier. Um, for the young kids that now, like when I was in high school and college, Avid was the only thing that existed, but no school had it. Um, so we didn't learn as a kid by any means. Um, and now, you know, with your Mac comes Final Cut, you know, so it's like you can start this in middle school uh, nowadays. So I think people now, when they get into a professional market, unfortunately don't know Avid first, you know. And so it's, it is a lot harder and it's frustrating to make that change. Mm -hmm. Um, so in three years, Avid will still be around. I think Avid in 10, 15 years is going to have an issue if they don't well, make things a little easier. There might for be nothing around it we know yeah. today. Uh, it'll just, a robot will do our job. Who knows? But That's another discussion, <laughs> which I think we're more than happy to yeah. engage on another day. Yeah, Sydney. Uh, I take a different approach to this whole question, which is I think, at least in dramatic, the, the, you know, the stuff that I work on, What's important to me is that I have an assistant who knows cutting room etiquette and who has who has a personality that yes. that I work with, who understands that you know there's certain times you don't say anything, and there's certain information you don't give to anybody, and uh, and somebody who has a, you know usually my assistant will cut the effects and the music hopefully, and also do the VFX, and I'm looking for someone who, who is good with those things. And I know I was on a pilot, finishing a pilot, and uh, I hired, the assistant I was with had to leave for another show, and I hired a woman uh, to finish it up with me, and it was an avid show, and I was going on to a series on Final Cut, which I was sort of shaking on. I'd only done one other show with, in Final Cut, and she didn't know Final Cut at all. She'd done it like film school like 10 years earlier. And I really debated and I, you know, called friends and talked to, you know, Final Cut, people who knew Final Cut. And finally I decided I really liked her a lot. She was, she was really good. Um, and I said, screw it. And I went to her and I said, look, are you willing to learn it? And she said, yeah. And the facility we were going to had a lot of people who knew it and they knew that she didn't know it. So there was no, you know, she didn't have to do a Whitney on them. <laughs> so, uh, um, and it worked out really well. And I've worked with her for a number of years after that. And it's so ultimately it's, you know, anybody can learn these systems. The ability to handle yourself in the cutting room in a way that's appropriate is, is very important. Mm -hmm. Organization, yeah, etiquette, ability to learn, openness. Yes. What, what I've always said is just about anyone, I won't say everybody because there's people out there who can't, just about anybody can learn what buttons to push. It takes the right person to know when to push them. 
Thank and, you. Thank and, you. <laughs> and so it, it's, it, you know, I always say, because there have been jobs where I've had where they're like, oh, well, you are an avid editor. You can't edit this. And yeah, I, I'm not a fan of Final Cut, but if the job is Final Cut, it's the best editing system out there. I love it. I would never think of using anything else. You know, but because it's not about like, like I said, you know, I say it, it, just because an artist uses a different brand of paint doesn't make them a bad artist. It, it doesn't change their ability to paint. You know, it's just it's the brand of paint that you're using, and I think that you know, like you were saying, no matter what editing system it is. You just need to learn it, and I, I agree. I, I I learned. I'm I'm old enough that my um, my college was one of the first six colleges in the country to have an Avid. We got there was a grant my senior year. We, there were six colleges around the country that got an Avid system. So we were the first people to ever touch an Avid. Like my professors and I sat in the edit bay one day for a half hour trying to figure out how to dissolve the end of my sequence because it wouldn't let us do that, you know? So, so even the professors didn't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So, so I was like the, one of the first generation that knew both the Avid and AB role editing and just kind of to, to touch on the point of know what's out there, know what's being used because I have had, I've gotten like three or four jobs solely because I was the only candidate who knew every type of editing system that they used, a, the AB role and the nonlinear. And so if you go in and you have this ego like, oh, I'm not going to learn Final Cut Pro, or I'm not going to learn Premiere, I'm not going to learn Avid, you are limiting yourself. And you need to at least be, even if you don't know them, be willing to learn them. Like, like I've mentioned before, I got a, the first time I got a job doing Final Cut, when I got hired, I had never touched Final Cut. By the time I started the job, you know, four days later, I knew how to use Final Cut and I kind of faked it till I made it because if, if the producer was in the edit bay with me and I couldn't figure out how to do something, I would blame it on, oh, you know, because was, it was a night job. I was doing my day job all day and then I would go and do this night job. And I would blame it on, oh, you know what, I still got my Avid brain on because I was working on Avid all afternoon and I just got to like, oh, I need to push this key and that instead of that key. And that would be like, you know, but I didn't go, oh, well, I'm not going to take this job because it's a software I don't know. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, I was, I learned how to do that. And, you know, you have to be adaptable. Right. So I think these are great things to take away help avoid disasters too. That's good. So is there anybody out there who could ask a question? Terry, go for it. Yeah. Well, first of all, I gotta say, Sydney, you're like the Zen master of editors. <laughs> yeah. When I'm listening to you tonight, like, yeah, and that's pretty impressive. Um, that's a good skill, by the way, for an yeah. editor. And that's what I'm saying, yes. Yeah, and, and it kind of leads into my, my question for you. Uh, one of the worst, I would call disasters for me in an edit bay earlier in my career, was um, the you know producer who just literally had a mental breakdown in the back of the bay, and I you know there's nowhere to go. I mean I got to deal with the situation, and you you find out how well you can be a therapist in a situation like that. So I'm curious how it, you know what kind of situations you guys have had like that, and and what percentage of being a therapist would you say an editor has to be prepared to be? Zen master, you start. Yeah. You know, I, I haven't been in a situation where people have, you know, totally broken down or, or I don't, you know, uh, I had one, one pilot I was on where the two sets of executive producers had developed such animosity on the set that they negotiated that each one would spend a day with me doing their notes, and then they would have a third day when they would sort of, you know, it's sort of like the Senate and the House, you know, and then the reconciliation. Uh, and so, you know, it was only a little bit kind of hairy when they were all together and they had to work, you know, kind of collate their notes. But, uh, and that was one of those 30 days straight or 33 days straight things. So, you know. At a certain point, you're so fried, it's, it's hard to keep your cool. But uh, I, I'm just not, I, I don't feel that's my position there. So, uh, Whitney. Yeah, I've had producers break, I've had crime producers, I've had where producers and directors are screaming at each other, and I'm just sitting in the chair. It's never about me in any way. 
Um, and usually, it's easier if you know them and you've worked with them before. You kind of know how they need to be, if they need to be coddled or leave a room or whatever it is. Um, so I, I think, and if you don't know them, that's when it's a lot more difficult because you don't know what they need. Um, I usually just kind of sit there and listen to what they're arguing about. Like I kind of stop working and just listen to see what they need and what I'm hearing, whether it's about an edit or if it's just a personality conflict, they're just yelling at each other. Um, and I wait till they kind of stop at a certain point and then I'm like, all right, if that's what you need, let's try it. Like you just, you do have to be, you can call it a therapist, but I just try to take both sides and if I can do anything about it, I'll just mention, usually I just, it's usually an edit they're arguing about and so I just do both. If they have completely separate opinions, I usually edit both while they're screaming and then let's sit down and watch it. <laughs> Um, but I, you do and have they to, can, I they have to fight calm. about the edit <laughs> yeah. after it's But done. it's like if they're getting angry, I definitely try to stay as calm as I can because it's like if everyone's having tension, that's not helping at all. So you definitely do have to get a little zen rub off on you and just kind of quiet down. And they kind of quiet when you lower your voice and just quiet them down. Cool. Whitney. Jennifer. I'm sorry. Jennifer. <laughs> you have to go again. <laughs> yes, okay. So, no, Whitney, could you, could you take the opposing point? Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, Jennifer. Yeah, I really haven't had that happen too much in my career. I mean, it might be mostly like if a you know, if, if it's a show where the producer gets notes from like the network and can't figure out what the network really wants or what the network means by an edit. And then it's just more just kind of trying to figure, help them figure out what it is about, you know, and I just, I, I can't think of any specific examples where there was people behind me arguing or anything like that, because usually in a lot of the shows that I've worked on, post is kind of separate, and so we don't have producers in the edit bay that often. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the example that I used at the very beginning about the, the, the show that we didn't have all the ISOs recorded, that was probably the biggest issue with producers in my edit bay wanting stuff that I absolutely could not give them. Mm -hmm. And that was frustrating, but you just kind of, you know, you just have to, you have to be the voice of reason. And if you get upset, then they're going to get more upset and it just snowballs. And so you just, you just have to be, you know, the Zen calm, you know, voice of reason. Wow. So we are ending on a Zen note here. <laughs> so that's great. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks everyone for showing up.